Hi, I'm Joe Roth. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and informing people about our life-saving mission. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, Johnson & Johnson, Guarini Institute for Government and Leadership at St. Peter's University, and by the Fidelco Group. Promotional support provided by Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey and by Insider NJ. Welcome to Think Tank. I'm Steve Adubato. We're coming to you from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio in Newark. It is our honor and pleasure to introduce Jennifer Bariso, who is a technology teacher at Robert Erskine and Peter Cooper Elementary Schools in Ringwood, New Jersey. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. You were part of a larger discussion we had with four extraordinary educators about uh, New Jersey and national issues around education and teaching. But you were in a classroom close-up special, correct? Yes with our colleagues and friends at the NJEA. This is about coding for kindergartners? Yeah. Um, it's a now, it's a maker environment, it's a coding environment, it's, and I kind of tried to bring it down to my kindergartners to start young and to just get them ready for what they're going to see in the uh, second and third grade. You ready to check this out? Ready. Here's the video from uh, Classroom Close-Up. Scotch in kindergarten, that seems right, but that's not what's going on here. These kindergartners are learning the fundamentals of coding. Is that a successful code? Yeah. Yes! Way to go! I think it's more like play for them, and I think that's the trick in getting kids to learn. This symbol means to hop in place, because both arrows say move forward with both feet going at the same time. We started with the paper arrows because they can see it in a line and then they can have the robot or the student move through that process and then they see what's wrong. Now this one moves again. This one stays. Now, can he jump with two feet together? No. No, right? So there's something wrong with our code. Problem solving is a huge part of coding. Right in here, what would you do different? Hey, that's an excellent idea. Can we say the word debug? Watching them be able to look at pictures and maneuver them and change them, and really using those words like debug and coding and programming is pretty incredible. Say, wiggle your fingers how many times? They're learning and making the connections that this is all coding. Whether it's on the floor and it's using paper or it's using the blocks, they're solving problems and they're thinking. We already worked on the floor doing our unplugged activities, so now we're going to do it on the computer. So we'll do the It's all a process. They started off with the paper and then they moved to the next step in the blocks and then they moved to the computers. I try to stress to them that it's okay to make mistakes. Mistakes are okay. You're not being graded on whether you get to this level or not. It's the learning that you are finding as you're going through the process. Like, oh, I, I meant to turn right and not left. I have to go up, not down. And it's sometimes just that simple switch that makes everything make sense. When you look at it, at first, it's surprising because they're so young, but when you watch them, you realize it's actually kind of natural for them. They have an uncluttered mind, so explaining difficult concepts like algorithms may be hard for them to grasp, but when you put it on the floor and have them hop around or give them some arrows and some rules, they begin to see how algorithms work with sequence and patterns. Through coding and programming, they're, they're being exposed to some of the biggest careers out there right now and the fastest growing. If you know how to do this stuff on a small level and they, they like it and they start to do it more and more, then 
they're setting themselves for up great career goals. So it's also career planning when they don't even know it. You're coding now. Give yourselves a hand. Simply awesome. As I'm watching this, Jennifer, all I could think of is, and I hate bringing it back to Think Tank because it's the name of the show, you're helping these kids think. Yes. I'm just trying to bring it down to the simplest of level and to build a good, solid foundation of them thinking how to get a fuzzy through a puzzle, how to walk through and, and know that the next step is the right step. And then hopefully as I build it through the first, second, and third grade, then I could set them on to the next school and they can build on from there. Where'd you get the whole hopscotch thing? Um, actually, my administrator got me that. He says, what do you think of this? And I was like, oh my God, I could so use this. Because it's very hard to find coding activities for kindergartners. Why? I just don't think a lot of people are doing it yet or, simpl or simplifying it enough for them to get it. Because they come in and they've been on iPads, they've been on phones, they've been on so many uh, touch screens that when I tell them to click on the X, they're like touching the screen. Um, so it's getting them to use the mouse for the first couple months of school because they've never used a desktop. So it's just breaking it down. So this is, it's interesting because this is not the same as, hey, how much time should our kids be on an iPad? It is more a question of using the technology to use your mind. Right. And, you know, I'm not going to say I, I, think, I think kids should use screen time less. But if what they're doing on the screen is, is building blocks that are going to help them think, help them mm. learn the step-by-step -step process, then that's okay. Yeah. If they're staring at videos all day and looking at YouTube all day, then that's, that's a whole other ballgame. We're also preparing these young people for future careers. Absolutely. Well done. Uh, Jennifer Bariso, this is Think Tank, and you are getting your kids to think every day, and we cannot thank you enough for what you do and your colleagues do as educators. Well done. Thank you very much. I'm Steve Adubato. This is Think Tank, and we'll be right back. To watch more Think Tank with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Think Tank welcomes Christian Estrelato, who is co-founder and chief digital officer, Estro Digital Communications. Good to see you. Oh, pleasure. Describe your company. Well, Estro Digital Communications, we're a digital marketing agency, and we focus on website development and e-commerce, and we focus on medical, hospitality, and real estate industries. We were your friends, our friends as well at uh, Commerce and Industry yes, told us correct. about you. And they told us about the fact that you're involved in something called Generation Now. Oh, great. What is that? Fantastic. So Generation Now is a subcommittee of CINJ, and it focuses on people who are 45 and under who we believe are being groomed by their superiors over at their firms and their companies to take over leadership roles. The biggest thing that we wanted to do was to both not just train millennials in the workplace, but also give them a sense of recognition and sort of empowerment mm. for them to actually start growing. And so they don't just leave their jobs that joke two years and quit. A lot of the people on our group, Generation Now, they've been at their companies for about five, 10 years mm. already. And they started in their 20s. So give us some advice. In our production company, we've had some incredibly, we do have incredibly talented quote unquote millennials, mm -hmm. right? By the way, I don't even know if the term is, what does it mean age-wise? Is it just in your 20s? Well, well, Pew Research recently just put something out in January. Millennials now considered 1981 to 1996. Really? The centennial is 1996 and up. But the funny thing is about millennials is that they really, that millennial attitude that they talk about really don't kick in until the mid-80s to the 90s. So I'm, I was born in 1981, and I'm in that cusp of Gen X and millennial. But there is a different sense of attitude with that. What do you think it is? Because I've been fascinated by the talent, mm -hmm. the commitment of hard work of the millennials we had. But in all candor, there are times that it's tough to keep millennials. And I often ask, is it us? What are we doing? What could I be doing differently? And then I ask, is there something different about certain millennials um, and about the millennial culture, if there's such a thing, mm -hmm. that moving on is the norm, even if yeah. it's a decent gig? Yeah. You know what, I think that's two very good questions. First, I think with the millennials, I just think because of social media, they ended up with a lot of instant gratification where they're looking for that promotion or that big job promotion instantaneously. But you know, being an entrepreneur, it takes what, years. It takes Yeah, a, I yeah, know. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. You're, you're very Some successful. of us are still working on oh, it. <laughs> exactly, and people don't understand, not, millennials don't understand that it's not social media. You can't get 10,000 likes in 10 minutes 
and expect that to be your career. So that's the first part when it comes to millennials. And the culture, one, the one thing I do agree with millennials, and since I'm in that cuss at beginning. Sure. Yeah, it's they started asking questions at work, saying, they started saying, is this the proper process? And we're very project management oriented. And some of our people in our company started questioning, hey, you know what, is this a better process? You know, and that's something that I, I enjoyed, uh, especially with some of our interns that we mm -hmm. hired, they're saying, maybe you should think of something differently. You talked about getting millennials ready to be leaders. I'm not talking about the technological piece mm -hmm. of it, the social media piece. That part, many millennials are mm -hmm. really good at. But I'm obsessed by the idea of leadership sometimes means having very hard conversations about performance mm -hmm. and feed, giving feedback. And sometimes it can be very uncomfortable for all of us. Do you think that getting and receiving feedback for millennials that's negative and less than glowing is harder because of the generation they're in? I believe so. I believe that um, because of social media, it really, I think- it What really, does that have to do with social media? Because everything is based on social media now for them. They're, they're actually getting critiqued on social media. They believe that social media is the world. And they grew, a lot of the younger ones, they're in their 20s, they grew up with the social media. You have to understand that 10 years ago, they grew up with that. And they How were, does that influence their, their attitude about interpersonal conversations that could potentially be uh, difficult? Like, there's a whole bunch of books out there on difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. Are difficult conversations harder to have with millennials because of social media? I believe so. I believe because they're not having conversations and they're talking mostly through Snapchat through whatever, Instagram, or, whatever. Instagram, whatever, and that they're not having these conversations. That joke about the, you have like four or five different um, teenagers just sitting on their phones and they're not talking, but they're still talking. What to do each you other. do with them? What do you, I mean, you are in that age group. On a certain mm -hmm. end of it, I am, you may find it's hard to believe I'm not, but in all reality, in all seriousness, how do you engage them? You just have to talk to them. And you have to, the one thing I did learn, what they're looking for, is that they're looking yeah. for guidance. And they are. They are looking for guidance. And when you give them that sort of guidance yeah. and you give them that sort of leadership, what you're talking about, they will actually start responding to you and they're gonna start looking to you more of a mentor and a leader. When did you know you wanted to be a mentor? Excuse me, not just a mentor, but more importantly, an entrepreneur. Uh, a, yeah. B, what does it take to be a great entrepreneur? Oh. First, my mother and my father, they're both immigrants from the Philippines. Right. And you work with your brother. And I work with my brother. They always said that if you want to make it in America, you have to be an entrepreneur. They said you have to own a business. That's actually, I don't know how they figured that out. Because they're both, they're both uh, my dad's a UPS lifer. He's about to retire. My mom already retired from Mount Sinai. She was a registered nurse. And they just said, if you want to be something, you have to be entrepreneurial. You have to own your own By business. By the way, you can work in a company and be entrepreneurial. Oh, you're, yeah, but, entrepreneurial, but, be, yeah. but an entrepreneurial spirit, you have it. Yeah. Describe what it is for people, because some folks who may not be in that world don't understand what it takes to be an entrepreneur. Well, that's ahead. a great question. The number one characteristic is tenacity. You have to have tenacity. And there's a good book. It was uh, called Grit. Yeah, Grit's a yeah. great book. And, but you need that tenacity. You need to go through that, have that How many times do you get knocked down? Exactly. I, more than my fingers. What do you do? Get right back up. Just get right back up. It's, uh, you know what's so funny? Is that quote from Mike Tyson. Everyone yeah, everybody's a got a plan until they get, get punched, punched in the, the face. face. So when you get punched in the face, someone like me, I'm going to get knocked down. I'm, <laughs> right. only, I'm only 5'7", so I'm, right. not, I'm not a big guy. But you always have to get right. back up. Innovation, the next, in medical marketing, the next five years, what do you predict in it? Uh, patient experience. I think improving patient experience from getting into the office, your actual time with the physician or the, the nurse practitioner or the actual physician, then afterwards explaining what you just went through. Christian, I want to thank you no, thank for joining us on Think Tank. You got to give us a lot to think about. Sorry, no, the thank cliche. You very much. Well done. This is Think Tank. I'm Steve Adubato. I'll be right back. To watch more Think Tank with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We are, in fact, uh, thrilled to be joined by our good friend Barry Ostrowski, who is the president and CEO of RWJ Barnabas Health. Uh, we're at the New Jersey Business Hall of Fame at Benefits Junior Achievement in New Jersey. One of your own, Micheline Davis. Indeed. Being inducted into the Business Hall of Fame. What does that mean Rightfully to you and the so. organization? Micheline is a role model to so many people, those of us that are in the business and those of us that are coming up in the business, and frankly, the youth of our state, to look at a woman like Micheline, who's an accomplished attorney and is now heading up our social impact division. Uh, and I think to be able to feed her and put her in the Hall of Fame recognizes that we can be leaders, we can be successful, and I hope that's a message that'll get out. So we're delighted. Let's talk about this, Barry. You and I talk about leadership a lot offline. For young people, 
the biggest message you have for them, because you've, you, education was important to you, working hard, et cetera, et cetera. But biggest message for them if they want to be successful in any walk of life? Right. I think leadership, frankly, is relationship-based. You need education, you have to understand the topic and the subject matter. But to lead people, you have to connect with people. And frankly, the worry I have uh, among the youth today that the connection is typically based on some digital transmission of information. That's not a good way to lead. If you're going to lead people, you need to create a relationship with those people, a relationship that builds trust, a, bit, a relationship that builds respect. And when that's the case, you will be a good leader. So I'm hoping that this phase where everybody's texting one another, that might be okay socially, but for business leadership, that's not effective. And the youth today need to know that if you're going to lead others, they need to build this uh, personal relationship. Face to face. And face that's the face. challenge for a lot of face them. Face to face. I, mean, I don't want to be, listen, I know there are a whole lot of young people who are very confident, interpersonal skills are solid, but a very high percentage of them have a hard time because of this. That's right. Am I making too much of that? No, I don't think you are. I mean, if, if, if you're going to rely both socially and for recreation on playing a one-sided video game or just texting, then you're going to find it difficult to create a relationship with peers or others that you are expected to lead. And I think all the confidence that we see in the youth today is challenged when there is a leadership obligation that has to be done face-to-face, -face, as you say. And so we teach it, we try to teach it. Junior Achievement uh, tries as well. Our Junior Achievement does a fabulous job making people understand because you can't conduct business or build a business without customers, without people, without colleagues. So collaboration needs to be done face to face. And that, I hope, is a mm. message that most of us have to get out. Yep. Uh, I think there is a confusion, you and I talk about this, between management and leadership. Biggest difference. Well, because management to me is an educational uh, discipline, so you can learn about managing things and people, but again, you're not gonna manage it effectively unless you're a leader. And so stepping beyond management is the leadership realm, and the great managers that we know, the great executives that we know, candidly, are far better leaders than they may be managers. That's interesting. Far better. So day to day, they might be able, may not be able to move A to B to C, but they're visionary. They see things. They connect. Is that what you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, and they also recognize talent, and they're able to offer the kind of guidance and support to colleagues within any organization. But left to the devices of having to figure out something down to some level of precision, the great leaders, the great managers, may not be able to do that. So leadership, to me, has always been the attribute that I think ultimately leads to success. Last question. You and I are not only big sports fans, but more specifically, we're Yankee fans. So I'm curious about this. Um, leadership and its connection to giving difficult, hard to hear feedback. Often in sports, a coach has to tell his or her player what he or she didn't do well, why it hurt the team, and what they need to do more moving forward. I'm obsessed by this, this idea of giving tough feedback. Do you think it's harder to give tough feedback to younger people who some think disproportionately have gotten too much praise? You know, the whole trophy, just, you know, that, am I making well, too much I, of that? Well, I tell you, of course, Steve, as usual, you've put your finger on a very, uh, on a critical issue. I tell our management team one of the most difficult things to do is offer constructive criticism. Hard to hear. But it's also hard to give, because in order for it to be effective, it has to be conveyed in a way where the listener understands that it is constructive, and it's being done for the benefit of the listener. So we have a lot of people who are very anxious to be critical of something that someone's doing, but not necessarily constructively critical. And so to your point, if you've grown up getting praise and praise and praise, and now actually meet someone who's willing to give you constructive criticism, if it's not truly constructive, it'll be absolutely rejected. Even if it is constructive, those folks are gonna be, have a tough, uh, difficult time hearing Because they're really defensive. Because they are. But, but I'll tell you, I, I truly believe that there are very few people out there, be they coaches or business managers or executives, uh, that are capable of effectively conveying constructive criticism. All said. Thank you, Barry. My pleasure. Always good to be with you, Steve. To watch more Think Tank with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media.
This is Steve Adubato. You see a lot of activity behind me. This is, in fact, uh, the annual Ranchery Conference. We're at Jersey. We're in Jersey City at St. Peter's University. This is called the Road to Salvation from Addiction to Employment. The New Jersey Ranchery Corporation is holding this conference. The folks who matter in government are here. In fact, Lieutenant Governor is here, Sheila Oliver. Um, Lieutenant Governor, let me ask you, today's conference is so important because? Because we have spent decades in this country and in New Jersey trying to address the issue of incarceration and addiction. We've collected enough data now to know what type of intervention works. And the kind of work that New Jersey Reentry Corporation is doing reduces recidivism, helps people who have been formerly incarcerated reintegrate back into society. And the most important thing is we're spending billions mm. incarcerating people. Most people, 86% of incarcerated people in this country are there because of drug addiction and substance abuse. So uh, I think the work that the Reentry Corporation is doing is getting to the heart of the matter, uh, dealing with sobriety and, mm. and getting people onto a track of sober living. Education is important. Significant number of people who have been incarcerated never completed high school. Only 7% uh, of people who have been incarcerated have college education. So we know the formula that works. This program costs about $2,200 per person. We spend $35,000 per person in our New Jersey correctional system. So uh, this conference is important. Opioid addiction, we don't have to even discuss. It affects every county. Uh, people are grappling with Across this nation. Across this nation. And, uh, you know, we are on the 95 interstate corridor in New Jersey. Uh, a lot of opioids are coming into our state. And then we have the issue of China and the exportation of fentanyl, which is killing people in our, in our state. So this conference is important. Uh, we're speaking with Lieutenant Governor Sheila Oliver. This is the annual Ranchery uh, Corporation uh, conference from addiction to employment. Easier said than done. These folks have come here to listen, to engage in a conversation about an issue that's not just a New Jersey issue, but it's across this country. A societal issue. So I'm going to ask you, uh, Lieutenant Governor, for those who say this isn't my issue because I don't have, I'm not coming out of jail. I don't have someone in my family who's dealing with this. You say? I say this is a major issue because it is affecting everyone. If I turn the clock back, people would think it was just African American populations, Latino populations, black and brown people. I can go into some of the toniest, most affluent suburban communities in our state, and I can sit in living rooms and talk to parents who have struggled with their children uh, with addiction and going to jail. Uh, years ago, that wasn't the case. It's different. And we know that for a lot of suburban kids have every uh, advantage. They start in mom's medicine cabinet. Someone had a short, sore shoulder. They got oxycodone. Uh, kids are invading their parents' uh, medicine cabinets, and that's where much of the addiction uh, amongst young young students, school-age students, is starting. But we know that we've got kids in New Jersey as, er as, as young as 11, 12, and 13 years old who are beginning to use d drugs. And uh, early intervention is key and essential, but people do not belong in jail for a disease. Addiction is a disease. We have enough research and data available to us. Something has gone wrong in the brain with those who are addiction. Sometimes it's genetic. Sometimes we can see intergenerational uh, substance abuse. We now are educated enough to know how to successfully fight addiction, substance abuse, and then incarceration. We are speaking to the uh, Lieutenant Governor, Cheryl Oliver. Um, let me ask you this, Lieutenant Governor. Government policy, how much of this is government policy versus the work of not-for-profits like this or, or religious groups? How much of it is government policy? Government policy has been on the wrong track for decades. 
uh, as both parties, both parties, Republican and Democrat. Um, but now there is a recognition. I mean, I look at our U.S. Senator. Uh, Cory Booker, who worked across the aisle, who worked with Rand Paul to craft a criminal justice reform. Uh, uh, Bipartisan cooperation, which is rare in the nation's capital. It is absolutely rare, but it is because there is a recognition. I belong to a lieutenant governor's association. I talk to lieutenant governor in places like North and South Dakota, uh, Minnesota, um, tribal nations. Many of our uh, LGs represent uh, tribal areas, Native American Indians, they're dealing with uh, substance abuse, addiction, incarceration. And I think uh, you can go to places like Montana, Wyoming, Ohio, which is kind of a conservative state, high rates of addiction and incarceration in the state of Ohio. So it has become a, a bipartisan it is not based on socioeconomics. It is not based on race, ethnicity, religion. Look who we have as our keynote today. We have Cardinal Tobin addressing this audience today. Um, so I think that uh, the time has come where people across all sectors are working uh, jointly. I uh, admire Jim McGreevy for the work that he has done. And he is heightening consciousness, and he's changing people's minds about how we deal with this issue. Lieutenant Governor Shalhavu, we thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, New Jersey Sharing Network, Johnson & Johnson, Guarini Institute for Government and Leadership at St. Peter's University, and by the Fidelco Group. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Hi, I'm Eric. You might see me as an ordinary person, but I've been living with a brain injury for nearly two years. One of my struggles is short-term memory loss. At Opportunity Project, I'm given hope and support and I've gained my comments back through the job placement program. Despite my challenges, I have a reason to keep improving. Today, even though life has changed me, I believe that anything is possible. If you have a brain injury, you don't have to face your road to recovery alone. 